I don't have any regret, you know, I don't have any qualms about shooting him. He's trying to kill us. And uh, at the same time, I'm looking at his family and they're just, they're looking at me and I'm looking at them. And it was just like, at that point, you know, we were just, uh, we were just, we were just people. All right, what's up, Shane? Hey, how you doing, man? Good, good, good. All right, man, so uh, uh, just tell me a little bit about um, where you grew up and uh, a little bit about your upbringing. Okay, uh, you know, I was raised in, uh, in Nebraska. Um, I grew up in a relatively small town, about 20,000 people in the uh, 80s and um, early 90s. Um, <clears throat> place called Columbus, Nebraska, to be more specific. And, uh, you know, I came from a divorced family. My parents split up when I was about five and uh, lived with my mom. And um, growing up, you know, this was back in the days when uh, we didn't have internet or cell phones or any much technology. So we, I, as a young child, spent a lot of time outdoors, uh, playing sports, you know, shooting guns, going to school, you know, that type of thing. Right, right. Nothing, nothing too exciting where I grew up. It was <laughs> small town uh, Midwest. So, um, now, do you remember the the a, a point where you um, were inspired uh, to join the military? Yes. Um, as far back as I can remember ever wanting to be something, I, I wanted to be in the, in the military. Um, probably as early as, you know, the kindergarten, first grade, I was infatuated with, with the military. In those days, early 80s, I can recall... Um, you know, there was cartoons such as uh, G.I. Joe, and <laughs> yeah, maybe you remember that as right, well. Right, right. But, uh, and that, and that it was a time when the, you know, the, the movies about the Vietnam War were popular. You know, we had um, the Rambo series, you know, you had Platoon. Um, what was another one? Uh, Deer Hunter. Right. Apocalypse Now, you know. <laughs> Top Gun. Top Gun. So there was a plethora of, of military movies. And for some, for some reason, I was, uh, I was drawn to that. That, that spoke to me. And um, I, I specifically remember, you know, watching these movies, specifically about the Vietnam War. And the Vietnam veteran quickly became my childhood hero and I remember telling friends and family I want to be just just like those guys and you know of course as a, as a young kid you know they oh that's cute you know a little <laughs> little Shane you know he wants to join the military but as I as I grew up and as as time went on that that desire for whatever reason <laughs> just grew inside of me and I remember you know watching the quintessential Marine Corps movie Full Metal Jacket in the 80s yeah and that kind of dialed it down I'm like okay you know I I want to be I want to be Marine Infantry and you know that that was that that, that, <laughs> that solidified it <laughs> do you remember uh you remember where you went and signed up your recruiting office was uh, no, I specifically remember um, in uh, 1994, I was a senior in high school, and and you have to remember back in those days we we couldn't we couldn't look things up on the internet to find out what we were interested in. We had to seek um, you know veterans out to talk about the military or or books in the bookstore. There wasn't a lot of things that were readily available and I was kind of a, a scrappy kid, um, a little disruptive in class and I remember my English teacher 
I was, you know, probably back talking him and he told me, he's like, you know, Shane, the Marine recruiter is down in the guidance counselor's office right now. Why don't you just go down there and sign whatever he puts in front of you? <laughs> and, uh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll show you. So I went down and I spoke with him and, you know, I told him that he's like, you know, I said, I, I want to be a Marine. And he's like, okay, you know, we, we had a kind of a general conversation. And I remember going through the, the preliminary ASVAB test to see, you know, how smart I was or wasn't. He's like, okay, well, you know, you, you, we think you can pass this test. You know, what do you want to do? And I said, what, what do you mean, what do I want to do? I want, I want to be a Marine. He's like, no, no, like, what, what job do you want? I said, well, I don't, I don't understand what you're asking me. See, I thought as a young kid, you know, every Marine was, was, a, was a grunt, was an infantryman. I didn't know they had all these other MOSs, right? <laughs> so uh, he says, well, we, you know, we have all these, these, you know, career paths you can go down, this, that, and there. I said, oh, I, I, you know, I want to be a, I want to be an infantryman. I want, I want to be a grunt. And he kind of looks at me, and he kind of, are you sure you want to do that? Like, yeah, I absolutely want to do that. And then he says, and I'll never forget it, and he says, well, he seems, you seem a little off. You, I think you'll fit right in. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what he said to me. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, maybe I was one of the, the uh, easiest poolies that he ever uh, assigned on because I was like, I, you know, I want 0300 in my, in my contract or I'm not doing it. Okay, well, um, took me down to MEPS and uh, we went through the physical and the ASFAB and swore me in. How old were you? I was 17 and my, my mother had to sign the contract. Wow. Yeah. Um, so uh, where did you go to boot camp? Uh, well, I, w I went to basic training uh, in San Diego, in CRD in 1995, and uh, 30 days after I graduated high school. So came from the, um, the flatlands of Nebraska, where there was no hills, and the <laughs> you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. And uh, showed up at uh, the Recruit Depot in San Diego on, uh, in June of 1995. Was it, a, um, was it quite a culture shock to you? Absolutely. I would say the first month of basic training was kind of a scared straight moment and trying to survive. And after that, after about, I don't know, five or six weeks... I started to, you know, looking back, I, I started to really assimilate into this warrior culture that I had signed up for. And I started to like where I was at, if that makes sense. Right. So um, <laughs> you joined, what year was it again? 1995. 1995. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, and your main uh, job in the Marines was infantry, right? Infantry rifleman, yes, sir. Uh, did you do anything else while you're in there? Um, I, I did a brief uh, stand in uh, in Marine Recon in the late '90s. Okay. And uh, my first, you know, my first enlistment was obviously a, a peacetime deployments. I would say those were some very uh, memorable times. We went on Western Pacific deployments where we visited a, a multitude of of countries and partied and trained and and uh, had a lot of, I had a lot of great memories I am um, and looking back and especially prepping for our, our interview I would say the Marines that I was that molded me during the my peacetime enlistment really prepared me for what um, was on the horizon and I remember reading a, an article about, you know, some reporter was like, well, is there a divide between combat veterans and non-combat veterans? 
And at this point in my life, I would, I would say no, because the Marines that trained me when I was a, when I was a boot and going forward were some solid, uh, some solid men and they were not combat veterans. And I remember in the early days, post 9-11, their legacy and the things that they had taught me, uh, it had carried forward and it helped me to um, make decisions in combat and, uh, you know, do the right thing. Right, mm -hmm. right. So um, you were, uh, eventually you became um, part of the evasion of Iraq, is that right? That's correct. Um, and um, do you remember what was going on in the, in the Marines, like when you first started hearing maybe talks about maybe going into combat? Like how did that all come about? Because, you know, you were serving as a peacetime Marine, um, but can you recall when, mm -hmm. you know, when you received information about maybe possibly possibly having to go into combat? Yes. Um, I re-enlisted in November of, of 2000. And I chose to, to stay in, in an infantry unit. Um, typically... When a, when a Marine completes their first enlistment and they decide to, to re-up, back in those days, pre-9-11, you know, the normal career course was to go to some sort of B-billet, whether you're become a drill instructor, um, a recruiter, or maybe a instructor at infantry school, you know, out of our MOS. <clears throat> For whatever reason, I wanted to not do that. I, I, I want to re-enlist, but I want to avoid the, uh, I think they called it the monitor back then, or the uh, getting, right. fl getting flagged for recruiting. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, well, you know, you can stay in the 1st Marine Regiment, okay. So, uh, made me a uh, rifle squad, squad leader in, uh, with, a, with a brand new unit who had just come back from deployment in you know, the end of 2000. And we did, uh, you know, we did our full workup, you know, everything that an infantry unit does before deployment. And that started in January of 2001. And then 9-11 happened and deployed. Uh, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, what's mm -hmm. that? What's a, um, what's a typical uh, workup consist of? Sure. Um... A workup, I guess, in lay's term, in layman's terms, when you're preparing for a deployment as an infantry unit, an infantry unit conducts various types of trainings to prepare for a multitude of, of, of combat situations and or peacekeeping missions in our case. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so we would go to desert training, we would go to urban warfare training, I was in a small boat unit that one of our specialties was, was clandestine boat raid. So we'd go down to Coronado when you go through a, a boat raid package. Um, what else would we do? We would, you know, you would do small unit training all the way up to the battalion level. And then the unit would um, participate in um, what was called Marine Expeditionary Unit Training where we'd be evaluated as an entire MU, Marine Expeditionary Unit, and get basically the green light to deploy overseas. Pre-combat, you know, you would go out on a ship, you know, if you were in a, you know, the 1st Marine Regiment, you would deploy aboard a ship for about six months, and you would go into the South Pacific and wait for something to happen. And in that time, you would train overseas with um, foreign militaries, visit various ports for, you know, liberty, where, you know, I would tell my wife, I'm just going to church, but, <laughs> you know, you know what we're out doing, we're out right. partying, right? <laughs> and uh, so that was, the, that was the norm, and when, uh, 
we had finished this entire workup when 9-11 happened, and I believe one regiment, or I'm sorry, one battalion from the uh, regiment was already deployed, so they went into Afghanistan, and we went after, um, shortly after 9-11 happened, a couple months after 9-11 happened, deployed, um, was gone until roughly July of, of 2002, and then when we came back, we, um, I stayed with my unit, and uh, a lot of training started to ramp up, urban warfare training, the PT got a little harder, this, that, and the other. And then December of 2002, we went on Christmas leave, and we were kind of a skeleton unit at that time. We hadn't got a, uh, we had not received new Marines yet from uh, infantry school. Came back from Christmas leave in, in January and the warning order was posted. Uh, you know, we're deploying and we all knew where we were going to Iraq. We received a, uh, you know, a multitude of new Marines from the re recent infantry school graduate graduation and I was given a, a brand new squad of, of Marines that had just graduated basic training and, and infantry school. And to a testament to the Marine Corps and them, they performed brilliantly, you know, going down range there. Mm -hmm. And we got on a ship and we set sail for Kuwait. And I remember specifically, we trained nonstop on that ship. We turned it into whatever part of the ship that we could acquire. We turned it into a, you know, a mock training area, mock battlefield and then um, got into Kuwait and eventually you know, invaded Iraq. Mm -hmm. Now when you, um, when you got to Kuwait, um, I imagine uh, you know, most of your Marines and yourself uh, had a pretty good idea you guys were going to combat, is that right? That's correct. Um, um, I, go ahead. I'm sorry, uh, mm -hmm. what, what was, um, what was the atmosphere like? Because, um, you know, I just can't imagine, you know, a bunch of seven, you know, you're getting, you said you're getting new Marines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of these Marines could be 17, 18, 19 right. years old. That's correct. Um, what was the atmosphere like and how did you deal with that? That was, um, it was, it was stressful. I don't remember, I don't recall having a, a lot of anxiety or fear of, you know, like, oh my God, what's going to happen? I just remember focusing on, well, we need to, we need to conduct as much training as, as possible until we cross the line of departure. And, you know, anyone that's been in an infantry unit knows that you know, in a typical, in, an, in a normal situation, you have, we would train together for months before we deployed. And we came together in a two week period and deployed and were in, a, you know, in combat within, you know, seven to six to seven weeks after that. Not really, not knowing each other, not being able to really mesh on a personal level. So I I really just focused on on teaching tactics and maintaining discipline. That that was kind of my my attitude towards it. And working with those young marines, like I mentioned earlier, that you know they they were dialed in. They they were not lackadaisical. They were not unfocused they I got the sense that they knew you know where where we were headed what needed to be done um, mm -hmm. so all of a sudden you find yourself in I in Iraq right during the invasion of Iraq mm -hmm. um, when you first landed in Iraq um, mm -hmm. did you feel like you were in combat and 
if not maybe right away, you recall the moment where you were maybe had thought to yourself like, okay, we, we're in combat. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in the shit here. Yes. Um, I remember when we were moving out to the, uh, to the, you know, to what's called the line of departure, the rally point to invade, you know, to cross the border there, the company commander, he addressed us all. And at this time we were, we were, uh, kind of in an isolation phase where there was no, there was no mail coming in. There was no mail going out. You know, obviously no one was making phone calls home or any of that sense. And he said, for whatever reason, we're, we're going north. And uh, <laughs> they didn't even have the name of the operation locked down yet. It, I remember it was, first it was going to be Operation, and I could be wrong, but it was Operation Cobra Gold to commemorate the breakout of, of the uh, American forces in Europe during World War II when they fought out of the, uh, the hedge groves. And then... Uh, I think the night that uh, you know we got the green light, they said, "Okay, it's going to be Operation Iraqi Freedom." And so, my um, my company, I think the the majority of us, we were in um, amphibious assault vehicles, and so we were crossing the border, and I was, you know, the the armored personnel carrier vehicles were opened up up top so you you could stand up there was room for about you know six marines to stand up and i was standing up and i was watching um i was watching the airstrike go down as we were we were moving and the first objective which wasn't assigned to us was a, a place called safwan hill and i remember watching that you know being bombed as where you are you know moving in that general direction and i said okay well this is you know here we go this is it and, you know, looking at the history of, of that area, Iraq, you know, Mesopotamia, the Persian Empire back in you know, those times, no one had really conquered that area. I think no one had, had conquered that area ever, right? And me, being kind of a history buff back in those days, I'm like, I said, this... this <laughs> This could end very badly. Or, you know, we're just going to sweep through and we're going to handle business. Um, you know, I felt uh, very confident in the Marines that I served with and under. I kind of felt like, you know, I'm walking with giants and sitting with kings as we are moving north. That... Uh, Anything that we came across, you know, we'd, we'd be able to, to handle just fine. And I remember the first um, firefight of that invasion. We came upon, upon Nazaria, you know, which, you know, your unit was heavily engaged in. And we stopped short of on Nazaria. And we kind of set up a hasty defensive position, and there was artillery right in front of us, and they were just sending Artie down range like all night. And I was getting, um, you know, I had my squad radio on, and the platoon commander would give a sit rep of what's going on in the, in the city of Nazari. And I remember him saying, you know, there's like three to four infantry battalions fully committed. Okay. And time came and said, okay, we're going to punch through Nazaria and we're going to keep going north. So we get through Nazaria, which is pretty chaotic. And just north of Nazaria, our company made contact, right? And it was my platoon and an adjacent platoon. They said, hey, we're taking contact from this. Um, I guess it would be, I get, I would describe it as a farmstead. There was some mud huts and some, you know, shanty shacks off to the right side of the, uh, the main, uh, route there. <clears throat> and our platoon, my platoon and an adjacent platoon, we were going to be the salt, the assault element. And 
I believe his first platoon was going to be support. So they're going to support by fire. And the Amtrak's pulled up, you know, right in front of this objective. And um, it was right out in the open. You know, and we, you know, disembarked. We got online. And um, I started, uh, someone, you know, we were being shot at, right? Mm -hmm. And I could see some muzzle flashes coming from uh, this farmstead. And I started shooting back, and <laughs> I specific, I distinctly remember, uh, you know, the dirt in front of me was was kicking up, and I could, you know, I could hear that distinct sound of bullets impacting around me that I was not accustomed to yet. And I was shooting back, and I was like, "Damn, am I am I shooting the the mad the, the dirt in front of me? Am I am I like you know am I shit in the bed here?" And I'm like, no, like someone's shooting at me. And, uh, you know, I looked to my left and my right and my squad and platoon mates were online. And some of the young Marines were, were looking at me. And I was like, we need to move forward, you know, like we're out in the open. Like, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to take it to the enemy. Like there's, there's really no other choice here. And I, I said that a couple, I yelled that a couple times and no one's moving. I'm like, all right, well you know, I'm the squad leader, so I get up, and just like we're taught in the infantry school, I'm up, he sees me, I'm down, did a, did a couple bounds, and then finally the, you know, the young Marines open up, and they just lay down hate on this objective, and we, you know, we bound up just like we were trained, and, and uh, secure the objective, and I, re I remember there was a um, there was a Republican guard um, Iraqi soldier that was shot in the leg, and as he sees us moving up, he's stripping off his uniform. He's like, I, you know, I don't want nothing to do with this, and he's he's surrendering, and we we got him medevaced. But um, yeah, that's probably my first taste of, uh, you know, legit combat going forward. So. Did, uh, um, did it, did everybody make it through that initial firefight? We did. Oh, nice. We did. Um, yeah. You know, you, you hear about in, in training, you're like, well, you know, if you get out in the open like that and you're moving forward, you're going to take casualties. But, um, surprisingly we, we did not. Thank goodness. So, um, I imagine there came a moment after that where you guys uh, rallied up and uh, mm -hmm. got a chance to recoup and uh, maybe talk about the incident. Uh, I'm just curious, um, what was the atmosphere like? How was everybody feeling? What was their, you know, what was going on amongst all the Marines after that fight? We didn't really have we didn't have a chance to debrief because it was you know get back in the tracks and we're you know moving north. You know, ba Baghdad was the objective, and we were just in the southern um, city of um, just north of Nazaria. So it was you know you get back in the track and uh, and um, you know refill magazines if you need to, and you know we just we just kept pushing and. Um, you know, we came to a brief halt and we set up in a defensive position and um, we started uh, we started taking uh, sniper fire. And, uh, you know, they rolled up a tank, called in Artie, and that was the big night of the, uh, a huge sandstorm came in. And if I remember correctly, we, the battalion commander briefing us, we were completely surrounded at that point. We had pushed so far north that um, you know we were kind of isolated for a brief moment and I remember it was cold uh, it was wet muddy it was a sandstorm and I could remember hearing the distinct sounds of you know those Soviet T-72 tanks that the Iraqis had were you know kind of I guess they were looking for us but because of such low visibility you know thank God they never found us and 
the next morning, you know, just got up, just, you know, filthy, got back in the tracks, and, you know, we kept moving forward. Um, what people, um, you know, when you're, when, when you're in an infantry unit, you have to contend with your, with your, the environment that you're in. And you're never clean, never clean enough, um, never, never get enough sleep, and you never really get a lot to eat. And that was starting to set in as we, we moved north. So we, you know, we made it all the way to Baghdad, and um, we were one of the battalions that remained, you know, behind after, you know, if you remember President Bush declaring the end of combat operations, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody forgot to tell the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we got redeployed, you know, to the southern portion of Iraq. And we were, at that point, you know, in a typical deployment, or in a normal deployment, I would say normal because this is not a normal situation that we're in. You have a, you have a date that you can count down to to go home. We did not have a return date on this particular deployment because, you know, Baghdad was supposedly be secure. Now we were deployed throughout the country to conduct um, security, stability operations, and one of our taskings was to conduct raids on suspected Ba'ath Party members and insurgents or other terrorists. And there was no there was no set date that we were to go home, so it was just you know, and this was back in uh, you know April, right? April of uh, two thousand three. So we start doing this, you know, our typical operation was, hey, what, you know, one day you're going to stay in the perimeter, next day you're, you know, you're going to be out conducting security and stability operations and, you know, some raids will come down that maybe the next day and you'll go and, you know, hit these objectives. And for, you know, for the most part, you know, it was, it was kind of a benign environment. It seemed, uh, you know, every once in a while someone would come shoot up the perimeter and, Whoever is on, on watch would, would take care of that. Um, but this started to, you know, grind us down, at, especially as, as summer hit because it was just oppressively hot. And we're out doing these operations and there's no end in sight. Literally no end in sight. We said, well, we're, you know, we're here indefinitely, you know. <clears throat> and... Um, in August, so remember back in April, Baghdad was secure. We're still here, not knowing we're going home. In August of '03, um, our company was assigned a, a raid of a of a very you know high value target at that time, and um, I speak about this because this is uh, you know kind of a a pivotal point in my in my life going forward with my last deployment and then you know progressing out of the Marine Corps so we got some legit intel from you know various you know intelligence agencies about this uh, this Al Qaeda operative that we're going to go conduct a, a raid on in August of 03 and if I remember correctly he was involved in you know this you know, what was later to become this IED campaign against coalition forces. And he not only recruited, he trained, and he operated um, as an Al-Qaeda operative. So we, you know, we briefed for this mission, you know, um, and then we stepped off at, at, uh, at, uh, at sunset and basically it was, you know, you know kill or capture this, this Al-Qaeda operative. And we were going to what was thought to be and was later found found out to be his, you know, his homestead, which was kind of, a, you know, those mud houses that they, most of them lived in over there along a, along a riverbank. 
And so at this point in the deployment, you know, a lot of our equipment was, was run down. We, you know, we had some of the early night vision goggles that mounted on a helmet. All of our helmet mounts had been, you know, destroyed throughout operation. So we, we couldn't even put our night vision on, right? It was kind of like an old school, mm-hmm. you know, you got your iron sights and that that's it. So we got on Humvees and we traveled, you know, for a couple hours through the night to this this um, objective, and um, get to the objective pre-dawn, and um, my squad was assigned with clearing the first um, set of of, uh, of houses or, or mud huts, whatever you want to call them. So we cleared through there. And the landscape was uh, light vegetation, so there was enough to, you know, to hide in. You know, if you're an enemy or friendly, there was enough vegetation to to hide yourself. We pushed through these these couple structures, and my squad set up a kind of a blocking position slash defensive perimeter on the far side of the objective, while the my adjacent squad. Um, started to assault a couple other structures off to our our right right Mm -hmm. and they made entry through a rooftop and you know what was later found out to be you know the terrorists we were going after started shooting at them and but we couldn't see them right because like i said earlier our night vision was was down our night vision goggles so you know i could hear the rounds going over our heads you know cracking by radio back to the lieutenant and said, hey, we're, we're taking fire. Um, it sounds like it's coming from this direction. I don't see muzzle flashes. I don't see any type of movement. So a couple more bursts of, of AK-47 go, uh, go past us. And um, the sun hadn't come up yet, but we had that pre-dawn light, right? Mm-hmm. So I started walking my lines. I said, okay, I got to make sure none of the Marines are, have been shot or, or wounded because we were kind of, we were spread out in this field with light vegetation. So I'm, I'm checking the Marines. Okay. Hear another burst of AK fire, you know, go over our heads. Still can't, still can't pinpoint where it's coming from. And, uh, go back down the lines, another quick burst of AK fire. There's a little bit of lull, right? And so, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check on the Marines again. And as I'm about mid midpoint of my, my defensive perimeter, um, you know, I saw um, a silhouette of a man with an with a AK-47 kind of coming through my area. And uh, probably, probably didn't know we were there. Because we were we were down on the prone and we, we had some covering concealment, and uh, we kind of met midway, and uh, you know I drew a bead on him and and, and dropped him. You know, I put about three I put three a three round burst, and uh, the bullets the rounds kind of hit him at the side of his stomach, just kind of the way we were positioned, right? And he falls down, and you know he's he's screaming, and you know I come over to assess the threat, and be, unbeknownst to me, and I don't know why this was occurring, but his his family was moving behind him with him, or it was probably his wife, uh, <clears throat> a son that was uh, probably you know, mid twenties and, uh, some small children. And, um, so I get over this little mound and, uh, his stomach was, was exposed and I could see, you know, fat hanging out of the side of his stomach from where I, where I, where I had shot him. And, uh, so his family, you know, they, they got down and, you know, they were, you know, they got down on their knees and they put their hands behind their heads and you know they're 
they're, um, you know, they're freaking out. They're starting to cry. Um, I remember, uh, um, what was, I assume was his older son, maybe, you know, mid twenties, which I was at about the same age at that time. And he was, he was frantic. He was, you know, rattling off in Arabic and then their father there, I found out all this through the Intel dump later was, you know, screaming and agonizing pain because I had gut shot at him. Right. Mm -hmm. So the uh, HET team, which is the human exploitation team, the interrogators and translators, you know, they were with us. You know, my Marines, they went up, they secured uh, the family, you know, they checked him. You know, we were doing all of our continuing actions as we had been trained to be, but, you know, I remember, uh, you know, looking at these people and, um, I was just like, man, you know, <laughs> you know, I had, I know for a fact I had, I had killed a couple, well, at least two, two people prior to this mission, but to, uh, to take someone down like that in front of their entire family was, uh, was a little off putting for me, even, um, even in the uh, the heat of the heat of the moment there, right. So, um, so uh, you know the interrogator translators they do their thing and and uh, we're securing the objective and you know we're following the, the laws of war. We're we're getting this terrorist who just tried to to kill me and my marines. You know, medical attention. I don't have any regret, you know, I don't have any qualms about shooting him. He was trying to kill us. And uh, at the same time, I'm looking at his family, and they're just, they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them. And it was just like, at that point, you know, we were just, uh, we, we were just, we were just people, you know. I was just another person in their backyard at that point. And I had just um, you know, closed out their dad. And uh, he, uh, this terrorist, you know, he died. Uh, he died, of, I think, a day later, I was told. And, you know, my platoon commander told me, yeah, that guy you, you killed was a pretty bad dude. But uh, that... I remember just feeling very off about that one. It it uh, it, it just felt very um, very morbid and um, immoral at the time because I think because it was in front of his family. Right. Yeah. Sounds like you might have uh, you know felt empathy just you know. I mean, maybe because you saw them as a family and just like a family you would see back home uh, in the United States, huh? uh, mm -hmm. maybe, right? That, that's correct. Um, we, uh, we had a relatable moment when we were in that, in that brief moment. So... And to this day, you know, here we are, 2021, this happened in August of 20, 2003. If I was an artist, I could paint what his family looked like. I, it's that clear in my head. And uh, when did you, mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. When did you get back? Um, um, we, How long after that incident did you remain in uh, uh, Iraq? I want to say uh, I don't think we got back till October, November. I don't, I don't remember the exact day, but it was, it was still like three, maybe three months after that. And um, so I get back. You know, that was my second deployment after nine eleven. 
And uh, that incident, I would say that that made, that little that little incident right there was when I felt a significant um, shift in my being. Um, um, so I, you know, I was I was raised. As I stated earlier, I was raised, you know, small town Midwest. Went to church every Sunday, and I, I remember. Where I went to church, it was it was the the focus of of the I don't know the education or whatever you call it was on the you know the Ten Commandments you know treating people how you want to be treated and then you know the big one thou shalt not kill right mm -hmm. and if you you know you look at that hanging on the wall where I was a kid there was no there was no like footnote on there <laughs> it was just like thou shalt not kill. Right. So, uh, um, so I get back and, uh, I, I ended up deploying again briefly, but, um, getting, you know, getting some, you know, you know, getting involved in some other combat operations, but that there's a few incidents that stick out, but I would say that that particular raid was maybe uh, a turning point and made the decision to, to get out of the, the Marine Corps um, shortly after that, at the end of my second enlistment. Um, how was it, uh, are you able to describe how it was affecting you? Um, yes. Uh, I, I felt... Uh, just kind of a, a deep sense of, of of guilt or shame, maybe. And again, it's because you know I killed this man in front of his his entire family, or you know what I thought was his entire family, and that just didn't sit well with me. And you know. What you know, being a growing up in the infantry, you know, because I was in my early to mid twenties at this time, and I'd been in the infantry since I was, you know, signing up at seventeen years old. Read a lot of books about combat and hearing stories about Marines or soldiers or whatever the case may be killing the enemy, and them speaking about it later and stating, "Well, you know, I, I always wondered, you know, who was waiting back at home for them." And in that in, in that situation, I, I well, I knew because I saw them, and I did it in front of them. And to this day, that uh, that still really, you know, that really bothers me. To the point where it keeps me up at night. Um, Do you have and, uh, dreams about it or um, nightmares about it? I don't have. I I, I don't think I've ever had a, a nightmare about that, but. Um, you know, I've had other, um, you know, physiological reactions from that. You know, your standard, maybe panic attacks or, you know, you just don't like. And I think that's kind of what opened up the Pandora's box of post-traumatic stress for, for myself. And... Um, did you get some help when you got out, or did you seek help, or did you know where to go? Um, you know, mm -hmm. no, no. I'll you know, uh, in those you know, I was uh, in those days. I was with my previous wife, and we had a small my my youngest my oldest daughter was was young at that time. Maybe you know she was. The Iraq deployment, she was maybe two. I was the only child I had at the time. And, uh, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I remember being deployed post 9-11. I would pray for my daughter. I remember, you know, I was thinking about this the other day before, you know, our interview, our conversation today. When I was in combat, I did not 
I did not pray for myself. You know, you'd hear about, well, you know, hey, if you get me out of this, I'll do X, Y, and Z. I remember praying for my my little girl who was one or two at the time. And I would pray that if I didn't make it home, that she would um, find, somehow be able to grow up without me and become resilient and self-sufficient and tolerant. So that was one of the main reasons I decided to transition out. Well, you know, what are most of us grunts qualified to do <laughs> to pay the bills? Well, we, you know, a lot of us go into law enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. So as I was nearing the end of my second enlistment, I was looking for employment and there wasn't really anything out there that could pay the bills and provide health benefits because my wife at the time didn't work. So I went down and I applied at a police department in Southern California and, and got hired. And um, got out of the Marine Corps on a, at the end of a, at, you know, around a Friday. And I was a recruit in the academy on Monday morning. So to answer your questions about getting help, you know, that wasn't really an option at uh, at the time so um, we basically just went from the military mm -hmm. uh, to uh, essentially another paramilitary type organization right correct as a um, senior sergeant who had deployed three times post 9-11 and now I was a recruit all over again how long were you a cop for 13 years no, thirteen years in the uh, in the Inland Empire, Southern California, um, and uh, I would say my my experiences in combat gave me more awareness. Working uh, as I worked a beat for you know a decade and a half almost, it um, I definitely had fear in perspective. I probably handled stressful situations a lot more calmly than maybe uh, a lot of the people that were not in combat. But um, it got to the point where I was never reckless, but I can tell you I was, uh, I was addicted to the, I became addicted to the adrenaline of it all. And I chose to stay, you know, working a, a uh, you know, a nighttime shift in a, you know, pushing a black and white, and um, up to that point, I, you know, this, these, this, these conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan just got significantly more violent, and um, I would hear about um, a guy I knew or was close to that had been killed in combat, or, you know, some of our veteran brothers who came home wounded were dying post-combat not necessarily of suicide but of wounds received or you know the medication that the VA was pumping these guys full of they were dying in their sleep and um, that that was really having a, a, a negative impact on me because um, I've always had a I guess a spiritual connection to that time in my life, maybe to the Marine Corps and to people that I, just to that whole culture and atmosphere, if that makes sense. Right. I've always, and to this day, I always feel emotionally connected to them. I don't really necessarily feel that way about law enforcement, but to the Marine Corps, it's like, you know, I feel like, you know, that's, that's my family whether I knew them or not. And um, so my experiences in war and the loss of, uh, you know, friends and acquaintances, you know, you, you know, obviously you're not close with everyone that I knew that was killed in action, but, you know, I was in the Corps for, I was in an infantry unit for uh, various infantry units for 10 years. So I knew a lot of the names and you just hear like, hey, you know, so-and-so got it. I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, you know, how long is this going to go on, right? And uh, I just started feeling uh, more and more disconnected from uh, my family. Um, 
and just from everybody. And I was just kind of looking for, it got to the point, I've never been like suicidal, all right, but I was just looking for that, maybe that call on the beat where I was just, you know, maybe going to go through the door and just catch one to the head and it was, you know, that was going to be it. Did you, uh, as a police officer, um, did you ever have to deal with any uh, similar incidents like you've dealt with in the military? Yes. Um, you know, I was involved in two officer-involved shootings. They were both um, suicide by cop. The first one was... Um, you know, a guy was armed with a machete and uh, this, that, and the other, and you know, I ended up, I ended up uh, shooting and killing him in the, in his backyard. You know, again, and you know, in front of his family. Um, that was pretty awful. And uh, second officer involved shooting it was another suicide by cop. I ended up, you know, shooting and killing the man. And. Um, yeah, a multitude of other violent situations, you know, everything that comes along of working in a, you know, relatively high crime area for that long. So. Now you mentioned that, um, you know, one of your most vivid uh, incidents in the military was, you know, killing that guy in front of his family. Mm -hmm. And then now you mentioned you kind of had a repeat incident of that, but now... Correct. On your, you know, on your, you know, in your own country. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. how, how did that make you feel? Um, I started to feel, um, you know, more and more disconnected. Um, just kind of, you know, I started to feel, uh, you know, anger. It was all the, you know, the classic symptoms of um, you know, panic attacks and, uh, Started avoiding, you know, family gatherings, crowds, this, that, and the other, and, um, you know, really just kind of disconnecting. What is it? In, ended up getting a divorce. Um, not because, not so much of PTSD, but that was, you know, that was a, a piece of the puzzle. Um, and I, I found that the only time I did not have these feelings is when you know, the adrenaline was rushing when I was involved in some sort of violent encounter. And again, you know, it was, it was, it's the weirdest thing because I wasn't reckless, but I, I felt like I was in the most control in those situations and I could think clearly and I was functioning at a very high capacity, you know, when, when I was faced with life-threatening situations. And then outside of that, I just felt like a complete, just mess and a complete stranger to, to everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, you know, it took a toll. And uh, like I stated earlier, you know, I, I kept up with what's going on overseas and, you know, hearing about people that I knew, whether they were friends or just acquaintances that were getting wounded or, you know, not coming home. Um. um are you still a police officer? No. No, I, uh, after my last shooting, and, uh, you know, I, I was divorced. I met, uh, you know, I met my, my current wife, who, uh, who's pretty amazing. You know, she, uh, she kind of, uh, just the way, you know, she is, and, positive outlook on life she kind of um, gave me the the will and the wherewithal and the want to um, take my life in a, in a different direction that was not anywhere connected to you know carrying a gun for a living so I left uh, law enforcement in 2016 and um, very uncomfortable, you know. I had been in a uniform for about 22 years, um, and I decided I'm not doing that anymore. 
So went uh, went to grad school, learned an entirely different uh, line of work, and around a bunch of people that had, ne had never been in the military and law enforcement, and uh, started over. I would say uh, I came to a realization where, and I'll speak military terms here, I needed a new mission because I was going down a pretty uh, dark path that was, well, I wasn't going to come back from. So it's easier said than done. Um, you have to... Uh, you have to ba basically shed this identity, so to speak, that you have built up, created it, and earned for yourself, and be able to be be able to have the mindset of like, okay, well, I'm going to be I'm going to be brand new again, and no one's going to really care where I've been, what I've done, and I have to be willing to fail at this. And I have to be willing to be treated like I am brand new again. And, uh, man, talk about, uh, talk about a long journey to get where I'm at today. But, um, so far, so good. Sounds like you're adapting and overcoming. Adapting and overcoming, yes. I would say my, uh, my message to my fellow veterans who are, have gone through the similar things is like you can uh, you were strong enough to do what you did and you're strong enough to make it out you're um, and you don't know you gotta uh, you have to be able to forgive yourself which I'm not sure I've fully done yet but um You, you have to be, you have to remember that at one time in your life, you know, you were, you were, you were at your peak performance, so to speak. And you can do that again. You just have to be willing to, uh, to go through that valley of despair to, to, to get there. And, um, I think, especially now, 100% of my motivation is for uh, for the men and women that didn't uh, that didn't come home, that are severely wounded, not just physically but emotionally, and and can't um, just can't find their path yet. And um, I'm at a point in my life, you know, I'm almost a middle-aged man, 44 years old to where I have this strong desire to organize things to benefit veterans and maybe try to be an example for them to be like, okay, well, you know, this guy was able to elevate him out of himself out of this horrible existence, so to speak, and, and carry on with a you know, semi-normal life. Awesome, Shane. Sounds like you're doing yeah. good, brother. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we turn it off? I would just say that um, you know, don't don't give up on yourself because um, there's always a way. There's always a way back, and there's always a way forward. Just find your new, find a new mission, and and set your course on that. That would that would be my message. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Shane. Mm -hmm. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back home. Long dirt road all on my own. I'ma be the greatest.